welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're here. Wasn't lunch delicious? Yes. Yeah. The salmon is so good, and I caught it all myself, so you should be really proud of that. I want to thank the presenting sponsors of today's event. Larry, where are you? Larry, would you stand up, please? This is, that would require moving the chair and standing up. Thank you, Larry. Riverview Bank. Riverview Community Bank, Larry Schwartz, we appreciate you. And Portland General Electric is also a presenting sponsor. John didn't, uh, wasn't able to make it today. He's putting out a fire someplace, I'm sure. We also want to thank our education sponsor, the Gresham Barlow School District, who has been in the press a lot lately. Um, so when there was a bunch of kids standing outside in front of Gresham High School this morning, we got all worried again, but they're having a band concert. They're having a band um, competition there. Um, that's the the students outside. I also want to thank our media sponsor. Okay, here we go. Metro East Community Media. How about that, Keith? I did it. Okay. They are wonderful, and they um, rebroadcast today's um, tele televi televised event. So, gentlemen, you'll need to find out from Keith when that's going to be rebroadcast, so you can see what you what you thought you said wasn't what you said. Um, we would like to recognize the elected officials that are here today. So, Mayor Bemis, would you please stand? Thank you so much for coming today. Could I have the other elected officials please stand at this point in time? Councilman Lori Stegman is here. Thank you. We have several others that signed up, but they're not in attendance yet. I'd also like to recognize our board members that are here today. James Denmark is one of our newest board members. James from Henningsen. Cold storage, and seeing none other ones, then I will go to the president of the board, who is also going to MC the, the event today. I'd like to introduce you to Warner Allen of Warren Allen, LLB. He is also the president of the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce, the best chamber in Oregon. Warren? Thank you, Lynn. Welcome, everyone, uh, to what I think is going to be an interesting um, opportunity for us to hear from the two principal um, people running for our next door neighbor, um, City of Portland uh, Mayor. So the first is Ted Wheeler. Um, Mr. Wheeler is currently the Oregon State Treasurer and is a sixth generation Oregonian, born in Portland, graduated from Lincoln High School. Uh, Ted received his bachelor's degree in economics from Stanford. Uh, he later earned an MBA from Columbia University and a master's in public policy from Harvard. Worked in the private uh, sector uh, before beginning his life in public service as Multnomah County Commissioner Chair. Uh, according to his mayoral campaign, website shortly after his election as chair, Mr. Wheeler worked with his colleagues to balance a county budget that called for $22.3 million in cuts in 2009. Throughout that process, Ted Wheeler fought to preserve social safety net programs to protect vulnerable Oregonians from predatory tactics. Ted led the efforts to construct the new library in Troutdale and to get the East County Courthouse construction project underway. He was appointed to the state treasurer position when then state treasurer Ben Westland died of lung cancer. Uh, at the end of that term, he successfully ran for the office. He's practiced aggressive financial management, achieving more than $172 million in cash flow savings since 2013. A couple things I'll bet you didn't know. He's an Eagle Scout. He's snowshoed to the North Pole. He's climbed Mount Everest and competed in Ironman triathlons. Lives in Southwest Portland with his wife and daughter. Please welcome Ted Wheeler. <laughs> Jules Bailey is currently the Mount Noma <laughs> County Commissioner. We did not practice. <laughs> <laughs> Serving District 1, which serves the areas west of the Willamette River and inner southeast. Jules earned his bachelor's degree in environmental studies and international affairs at Lewis and Clark. He studied in a dual degree graduate program at Princeton University's Woodlow, Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, and in 2007 earned two master's degrees, one in public affairs and one in urban regional planning. 
Jules was elected to the Oregon House of Representatives in 2008 and served three terms there. The Oregon League of Conservation Voters named Mr. Bailey the Innovator of the Year in 2009 for promoting the renewables industry during the 2009 legislative session. According to his mayoral campaign website, as a county commissioner, Jules has been a leader on Portland's efforts to house every veteran. He helped make Multnomah County the first in the nation to move to a $15 per hour minimum wage and the first to implement a paid family leave policy. He is taking the lead once again with real solutions on how Portland can address climate change and support the environment. A few highlights are working with the legislature to enact a meaningful state carbon tax um, cap and trade program, build a climate smart transportation system, implement congestion pricing, and funding infrastructure that promotes walking, bicycling, and transit. Jules lives with his wife and baby son in Multnomah. Please welcome Jules Bailey. And all that having been said, we will now ask Ted Wheeler to come to the podium. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, both Mayor Bemis and Commissioner Stegman for, uh, Councillor Stegman for being here uh, today. And thanks to all of you for being here and expressing an interest. Uh, my name is Ted Wheeler. I'm running for Mayor of Gresham. <laughs> that's as funny as state treasurers get. I just want you to know. That's, that is the totality of my good laugh lines for the rest of my seven minutes now down to six and a half. Uh, so I'm running for mayor of Portland. Uh, it's great to be back here in Gresham. Uh, and I'm really energized about the opportunity that's ahead. In a lot of ways, having rolled off of six years as your state treasurer and jumping back into local politics with both feet, for me, uh, this has been a really exhilarating experience. And it reminds me that it wasn't that long ago that I stood in this room as a candidate for Multnomah County Chair back in 2006. Nobody had a clue who I was or what I stood for or what I would do. And frankly, the public took a bit of a flyer on me for that particular position. But I made a lot of promises then. And one of the key promises I made that if you elected me your Multnomah County Chair, I would work tirelessly as a regional partner, and I would address the issues that were important in East Portland and East Multnomah County. And I like to believe that I lived up to those obligations. The first thing I did, of course, was I agreed to meet with all of the mayors in the region. So I met regularly with the mayor of Gresham, the mayor of Troutdale, the mayor of Wood Village. Uh, I even had uh, a regular presence in Corbett. And it was very important for me to be part of regional discussions because then as now, economic issues, transportation issues, housing issues, issues with homeless, they are a regional problem. The city of Portland cannot act as an island. When we're looking at the issues that Jules and I and others talk about, as candidates for mayor when we're in Portland, whether it's the homelessness crisis, whether it's housing affordability, whether it's economics and job creation, whether it's maintaining critical infrastructure, those aren't just Portland issues. Those are regional issues. And if you, uh, well, you can't vote for me, most of you, for mayor of Portland. I'm still thinking about this Gresham job, though. I understand it's paid now. It's paid now. <laughs> Um, but you have friends. I like to believe you all have friends in Portland. And I, I hope you'll tell them that it's important to support somebody who sees things through a regional lens. I'm very proud to stand here with the support of your mayor uh, and the long partnership that we've had. I'm proud to have uh, Multnomah County Commissioner Diane McKeel's support, who represents this particular area. And I even have my old friend Lonnie Roberts support for this. And it's not because they agree with me on everything. In fact, frankly, I'd wonder what was wrong with them 
if they agreed with me on everything. It's about partnership, about communication, about collaboration, about understanding that nobody can solve these issues of homelessness and housing and economic opportunity and transportation alone. And I'm proud of what we accomplished together during my tenure as the county chair. As was alluded to earlier in the conversation, for over 25 years, people had talked about building an East County courthouse. When I got into that leadership position, I changed the status quo and I worked with my partners in East Multnomah County and I worked with the mayor and others to talk about new partnerships, new financing models, ways to keep the costs low, and we got it done. There was an opportunity to attract a company, FedEx, into Troutdale. 900 jobs at stake. And they were interested in other places too. We wanted those jobs here. So collaboratively, the mayors and I worked together to do all of the transportation updates. Uh, I think it was the 148th Avenue underpass under the railroad that we had to negotiate to try and widen and deepen that underpass so that the FedEx facility could be a viable facility. It was standing in the way of approval. We got it done and today there are 900 jobs in East Multnomah County that would not have been there had the county not been a full player in that. We worked together, as you heard, on the library expansion. Troutdale had been promised a library for I don't know how many years. It was forever. Uh, and in fact, a levy was passed by people in this area with the promise that there would be a Troutdale library, and it never happened. Under my leadership, we lived up to that commitment. We got it done, because when a government makes a commitment, it should fulfill that commitment. We worked together on law enforcement issues. Gang violence is not a new issue in Multnomah County, and we worked together to improve resources there. We expanded patrols in the Columbia River Gorge because tourists were expressing concerns about public safety. We also even included the school resource officer in the community of Corbett up the road. It was one of the one things they'd asked for year after year after year, and we got it done because it made sense. And even at the height of the recession, when I had to find $45 million in budget cuts at Multnomah County, we expanded the Sun School program in East Multnomah County because it helped the families that were increasingly move here. You've got a homelessness problem, we've got a homelessness problem. Mayor Bemis is working hard on the E. Um, on the uh, Springwater Corridor Trail. The port, city of Portland needs to do its part. We've got a housing affordability in problem in Portland. That's moving people east, chasing affordability, and it's putting pressures on your school and services. We need to create more affordable housing. When it comes to jobs, we all understand the importance of the Columbia Corridor in the Portland Harbor region in terms of jobs where people who live here can actually work. And we have to continue to work together collaboratively to make sure that all of these issues aren't solved in a vacuum. I pledge to work with you here in Gresham and elsewhere around the region as a regional player around development, planning, housing, homelessness, all of the issues that are critical to the future growth of our region. Thank you for having me here today and I certainly look forward to answering all of your questions. Thank you. And now, Mr. Bailey. Well, thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here today. I'm Jules Bailey, Multnomah County Commissioner for District 1. And I have to say a quick thank you, because just prior to this, I was actually on a jail tour uh, in the Multnomah County uh, at jail and downtown. And I got to leave early to be able to come here uh, to speak. So you were my get out of jail free card. So. Uh, Thank you all so much. That's, that's as much humor as economists that have. That yeah. A <laughs> I'm currently Multnomah County Commissioner. Prior to that, I served three terms in the Oregon State Legislature, where I took tough votes and took on issues that are of importance not only to our state and to our city, but to our region. And I'm proud of the work that we've been able to accomplish together. I'm an economist by training, and so I understand markets, I understand the importance of working across lines that are sometimes arbitrary and that our constituents and that the public don't see. Because 
Ted mentioned it, I, I will echo the same comments. We are a single region, and I so appreciate the fact that you have invited us here today to have a conversation with all of you. I think it shows a hand that is extended in friendship and a handshake and an acknowledgement uh, of that fact. And too often, the handshake is not returned. The hand is not given back from Portland uh, to Gresham and to our regional partners. And that acknowledgement is sometimes uh, lacking. So I want to be here today to say thank you uh, for hosting us and for uh, an understanding of the importance of, that we all have uh, to each other. And as we look at our region, not only are we one economic region, uh, we're one cultural region and one housing region as well. As County Commissioner, I've worked on these issues firsthand. I currently chair the Oregon Solutions process for Levee Ready Columbia to upgrade our levee system uh, in the event of the kinds of flooding that we're going to see happening more often, especially potentially as our Columbia River Treaty changes to protect businesses in the Columbia Corridor uh, from uh, those worst effects of, uh, of that flooding. And I've been working very closely with Gresham, with Troutdale, and I applaud you for coming to the table and for bringing resources to the table uh, to do that. As Multnomah County Commissioner, I've worked hard on helping to create an area commission on transportation through the Joint Policy Council Advisory Council on Transportation at Metro. Having a single act for our region will help coordinate our transportation investments, working with the Oregon Department of Transportation, working with our federal partners, because transportation and our ability to get goods to market and people around the region are at the core of how we have a healthy economic region. As a state legislator, I worked on new market tax credit programs that have helped bring federal dollars and state dollars to our region and to Gresham for investment in business expansion and capital development and in projects that have helped increase jobs in the region. And as a state legislator, I w voted for the Columbia River Crossing because I believe that we need a transportation connection in our region that helps all of our goods get to market and that supports a strong port that will allow the kinds of businesses that are here uh, to be able to uh, work and get access to markets that are uh, overseas. Going forward, I believe that we need to have that strong partnership, that the mayor of Portland needs to be front and center in these conversations, that the mayor of Portland needs to be working hand in hand with Gresham, with Troutdale, with Wood Village, with Fairview, with Maywood Park, to be able to have an understanding of what the economic needs of the region are and how we invest in a regional transportation system, in a regional economic strategy, and a strategy that says that this is not a zero-sum game. If Gresham attracts a business to locate, that doesn't mean a loss for Portland. If Portland attracts a business to locate, it doesn't necessarily mean a loss for Gresham. We have to understand that workers commute across these boundaries. And that when we look at the Columbia Corridor as just one example, there's an amazing map that you can look at. It shows where people who are working in those industrial jobs live. That's a corridor that spans several different jurisdictions. And the line is so clear. People who live east of 205 are commuting to those jobs. People who live west of 205 are not. And that's because we have a region uh, that is becoming more and more separate. And yet what we need is a region that's coming together on a singular economic development strategy and on a singular strategy for how we support a workforce. Housing affordability is a challenge. My wife and I saw this for, firsthand when we entered the housing market uh, last spring. And it's becoming a reality for too many people in Multnomah County. Gresham is suffering from housing prices that are spiking and from neighborhoods that have historically been affordable and that are now no longer affordable uh, to working families. As we address our housing supply issue, because we have a demand side problem for which we need a supply side solution, we have to work at every er in every area within the urban growth boundary to understand that in fact this is a regional housing market. And as we increase supply, it can't be just about infill in inner southeast Portland. It's also got to be talking about how we continue to support good workforce housing across uh, our economic region. On mental health, we have a mental health crisis uh, in, our, in our region. And as a county commissioner, one of my top priorities was to fund the Unity Crisis Mental Health Center that will be opening in Portland. I want to salute 
all of you in this room, and especially Mayor Bemis, I know that the city has been very active in discussions about transport to that facility and from that facility, because we need a regional solution to our mental health crisis, because there's no cavalry on the horizon. The feds aren't helping. Uh, so we need to do this uh, locally. As we address poverty, I've as Multnomah County Commissioner worked on an expansion of the Sun School program and a change in that program to better meet the needs of East County. Because we need to have a Sun School program that reflects the fact that we have too many kids in poverty who are living on the border between Portland and Gresham and who are in the areas that are, have historically been underinvested in. And finally, we have a homelessness crisis that needs a clear and concrete solution. As a Multnomah County Commissioner serving on the Home for Everyone Coordinating Committee, we made a pledge that we would house every veteran in Multnomah County. Mayor Bemis stepped up uh, on this, your city council stepped up on this, and together we are now in the process of being certified by the federal government as having officially ended homelessness in Multnomah County for veterans. <laughs> for veterans. <laughs> Excuse me. But we have so much more work to do. And that's going to require a mayor who's going to reach back that hand of partnership and of friendship to say, we're in this together. We recognize that a win for one is a win for all. And I'd be that mayor for you. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Um, so question and answer time. Uh, we've got a mobile mic. If uh, somebody uh, has questions, and I'll start off just to break the ice and ask each of the candidates to give us their position on IP28, which I think, although it's not yet certified, is going to be. Uh, and for those that uh, forget what that is, that's the gross receipts tax um, that is going to be on the ballot. Uh, no, you can come up here. The mobile mic's out there. Great. I'll go first and save Ted because I probably have the least popular answer in the room. But I have come out in uh, favor of I've IP28 as it's been written. I recognize some of the challenges with it. Uh, but when I graduated high school, I saw the worst effects of ballot measure 5 and 50 uh, taking effect. And uh, we lost 17 teachers in one year. I served in the legislature for six years for three terms. And I've heard over and over since those cuts have happened, we need a solution for schools. And yet there's never been one on the table. There's never been an option to be able to put the kind of investment into our public school system that's needed. And so at this point, I'm willing to take anything uh, that has a chance of being able to put real investment back into our public education system because I believe that at the end of the day, having a strong public school system is the backbone of economic development. I don't begrudge Jules his answer at all, and I want to be very clear. Um, I may yet support IP28. I think it's very important that we have funding for our schools, and uh, I have long said I would support additional revenues, particularly for mental health services at the community level in this state. I'm just disappointed that the lack of leadership in this state has got us to the point now where we effectively have a choice of voting for something that we don't fully understand, and I don't fully understand it. I don't understand the regressive, you know, who, who's actually bearing the burden? Is this regressive? What is the impact on lower income folks? What's the impact on the city of Portland? What's the impact on business development and industry? And by bypassing the legislative process, we're less likely to know. We don't have the Senate Revenue Committee chiming in. We don't have the Legislative Fiscal Office. We don't have the state economist. You don't have the state treasurer or anybody else. What you're going to get is a costly and divisive talking points oriented battle at the ballot. The same kind of things that brought us measures 547 and 50. And so I have said, I hope there is an opportunity for a leadership moment here, because this isn't going to be voted on until November. And I'm ready to be part of that leadership to talk about how do we get revenues for the things that, frankly, there's broad agreement between Democrats and Republicans. How do we get them? 
and avoid a costly and divisive battle at the polls. I'm worried because this is a battle, but it's not the war. When this battle is over, if it passes, um, yeah, you know, there's still other discussions that need to happen, and right now we're all being squeezed between business and labor. And I think that's a shame. And I hope there is an opportunity for us to talk about a third way, an Oregon way, that's collaborative and supportive and gets us towards the goals we want to achieve with clarity on what the impacts are of the vehicle that we are choosing to use. Question? Yeah, I'll just stand right. I'm staying right out of the camera lens, <laughs> I think. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for both coming here today. Uh, as a former political advisor, I would have told both of you to stay in Portland where your voters are, but we really do appreciate you guys coming out here. Uh, my question is, is, so I actually live in Sandy, and I work in Portland, and I do business, obviously, here in Gresham and Portland, so I got to travel through Gresham to Portland, I got to make a decision whether or not to go down Powell or to go out to I-84. Scheduling my daily schedule is a pain. I'm either to a meeting 45 minutes to an hour early or I'm stressing on my way because I'm 30 minutes to 45 minutes late depending on traffic. How, uh, we've both, you've both touched on a little bit, but on infrastructure, what are some of your plans uh, to really improve the commute, uh, both for people like me that's traveling around on business, personal, but also you have goods going both from and to uh, different businesses in the Portland metropolitan area? Yeah, good question. First of all, um, there is a disconnect between transportation planning and where housing and jobs are actually ending up. What you have is a migration taking place as families in Portland are displaced and chase affordability eastward. They're moving farther and farther from their place of employment. And as Jules just mentioned, the Columbia Corridor region and the Portland Harbor disproportionately represent family sustaining jobs in our community that do not require a college education. So what you're seeing is longer commutes because we have not adequately planned for the supply of workforce housing in the city of Portland. And so there's these regional discussions, and by the way, it's region wide, uh, that take place through the metro regional government. Uh, you have the housing increasingly on one side of the region and the jobs on the other side. So part of the problem here isn't just infrastructure, it's planning. Where are the housing? How do we create jobs? The second area is around industrial lands in East County. The greatest opportunity, as I say, for communities of color, for low-income people to be able to get family-sustaining wage jobs is on d industrial lands. Uh, I supported Senate Bill 565, I think that was the number, in the last legislative session that would have given communities like Gresham, like Portland, the leeway to provide incentives to restore brownfield industrial lands, to help support the kind of jobs that are close to the housing so people don't commute as far. When it comes to infrastructure, the reality is we're probably not going to be creating new roads and new highways, so we need to also talk about transit options for people who are willing to use transit. Right now, East Portland and East Multnomah County are underserved by public transit options. So people are moving farther away, they're lower income, and they have less access to public transit that could get them back to their places of employment. All these big pieces need to fit together. And again, I think there's a credible case for a regional play here. Well, first of all, as a political person, uh, you're, you're probably right that, uh, that the time is best spent with Portland voters, but I hope the fact that we are here today uh, is an indication of how much we value partnership and how much uh, we want to be uh, mayors who are working with uh, this region because we're willing to spend time during a campaign uh, to come out here and have uh, this conversation. The issue that you bring up is one that I hear from a lot of folks. I hear it from people that are commuting in from Sandy. I hear it from people uh, that are uh, within uh, Multnomah County. And that's one of the reasons that uh, I helped create the Area Commission on Transportation and did it in a very particular way. There were proposals that were on the board uh, that had said, let's just look at one, let's have two area commissions on transportation uh, that are uh, smaller versions that are just 
Portland or just Multnomah County or just the, the UGB region and then sort of the broader shed around that. And we actually ended up creating a larger uh, area commission on transportation to reflect the fact that we have a commute shed that is representative of people that are coming in from Sandy, from Hood River, from other places. And so we needed a regional planning entity to be able to coordinate investment and be able to match up jobs and transportation. Part of the next step is that we need a mayor of Portland uh, who can bring the weight of Portland, its voters in the city, working with Mayor Bemis, working with other mayors and other elected officials who can have the credibility in the state legislature uh, to help argue and for and craft a transportation package in the 2017 legislative session that will help bring needed investment into that area uh, to be able to solve some of our transportation challenges. And my relationships and my experience in the legislature, I think, will help me do that uh, as mayor. Beyond that, Ted's, Ted's exactly right. We also need to look at how we get folks uh, off our roads. One of the challenges that we have is we have very poor public transit system, uh, system, especially rubber tire bus service, in a lot of areas of East Portland. And so for folks that are living there, they don't have a lot of other choices. They have to drive. Those are folks that are getting on Powell. Those are folks that are getting on uh, Burnside, getting on I-84, uh, and creating a lot of congestion. And a lot of folks there would really rather uh, take the bus. It's cheaper for a lot of people. Uh, so improving public transit there can then help free up road capacity for freight movement and for people that uh, don't have an option to take public transit because they live uh, farther out. Ultimately, there is not going to be a federal government that's going to come in and fund all of the road capacity that we need. So we're going to have to focus on state and local solutions, including solutions that help free up capacity for critical movement, including freight. And that's actually one of the reasons why, although it's been controversial, I've talked about congestion pricing uh, in this race because there are a lot of people in the freight community that actually value that uh, and see it as a way to be able to free up capacity for freight uh, on the roadways by having other trips that then uh, are go to a different place or through another mode. But part of the challenge there is that's going to have to be coupled with better public transit investment so people have a choice and an option. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Lori Stegman, Gresham City Council. And, and I do appreciate the fact that you are in Gresham because we are the fourth largest city uh, and I appreciate uh, the hand being extended. My question is is that uh, we, we are all dealing with the issue of homelessness yeah. and s geographically along the Springwater Corridor. So my question to you is when you look at the jurisdictions involved, Metro, City of Portland, City of Gresham, and I realize that this is a regional issue, but we have a specific issue right now on the Springwater Corridor. And I'm just wondering what each of you might propose uh, in, in the way of a partnership to help alleviate homelessness and the issues that that brings that uh, are occurring along the Springwater Corridor in Gresham. I appreciate that question. And homelessness obviously is at a crisis point. And some of that partnership that you're referencing already exists. So I serve on the Home for Everyone Committee, which is a, a joint Multnomah County, uh, the cities of Gresham and Portland uh, are, are on it, as well as the federal government, the private sector, the faith community, and service providers. And we have the city of Gresham represented on that executive committee. Uh, and that's where we set those goals around cutting the unsheltered population in half, around uh, ending veterans' homelessness around getting a family shelter that's finally up and running 365 days a year, so seven days uh, a week, 24 hours a day. Uh, now, specifically on dealing with Springwater Corridor, part of the challenge is, is that right now, we have a population of homelessness that uh, isn't uniform. We have some folks that are on the streets or on Springwater Corridor who are there for economic reasons. Uh, we have folks who are on the streets who are there, and a lot of them, uh, with mental health or addiction uh, issues. And then there's a small proportion of the population that's there uh, because of it's, it's more of a lifestyle uh, issue. And the challenge is going to law enforcement and saying to law enforcement with their public okay, go be social service workers and uh, go distinguish between people that are economically homeless, people that are homeless for mental health and addiction reasons, people that are homeless because it's a lifestyle issue. Now go sort all those folks and get them to where they need to be uh, while at the same time not having enough capacity for the people that need help. It's a fairly untenable problem. Uh, so one of the things that I've said, and this is based on a lot of best practice from around the country that's worked well, is 
We need to deploy better temporary emergency shelter. Tent camping is a symptom of a larger disease. It's a symptom of the fact that we don't have enough low barrier places that are connected to services for people to go. So rather than permitting tent camping, I think we could do a much better job of permitting things like church basements and nonprofit centers and uh, even ground floors of parking garages and other places where we can get people on an emergency basis that's less expensive than big facility-based shelter connect that into mental health and addiction resources, and then move through people through a pipeline to support of housing, because ultimately housing is what resolves homelessness. Shelter does not uh, resolve homelessness. Uh, it's not sexy, it's grunt work, but the, we know what works. We just need to have a consistent political will to be able to do that. And as we get those open, and we have 600 new beds of shelter coming online, and with some proposals that I'm working with Chair Kafori and Mayor Hales on, we may be opening another 650 shelter beds. That's a lot of increase in capacity. Then the law enforcement situation becomes a lot easier uh, because then we have a place for people to go and the message can be essentially, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Uh, and it becomes much easier to be able to do that enforcement. Partnered with that on the Portland side of the equation at least, and I'm not as familiar uh, with the Gresham Police Department, but on the Portland side of the equation, we need more police officers. We have a staffing ratio of police officers that's amongst the lowest for cities our size. We have a police force that's stretched too thin, and we're asking them to do too much. And so as mayor, I've pledged to increase that staffing as part of the solution. When I got into this race, I declared the homelessness situation the number one issue <laughs> facing the city of Portland. This was before the city or the county had declared any emergency uh, on day one. I took a lot of flack from a lot of the current providers of homelessness services because they thought I was not supporting their plan, which I am, because I declared that by the second year, the end of the second year of my term as mayor, we would have enough emergency overnight wet, you know, dry and warm alternatives to, for everybody who was counted as living on the streets in this city, two years into my term. People said on that day, the day after, and you can go look it up, you can Google it, it can't be done. It's a pie in the sky kind of alternative. So I'm thrilled with the work that Jules and Shane and others are doing. They've opened about 300 beds so far this year. Jules says there's another 650 coming. Uh, Jordan Menashe, a private sector real estate developer, offered up 150. A strip club got converted into an overnight shelter. Um, there are others who are stepping up. Uh, so before I've even taken office, we're two thirds of the way there to what I declared uh, before that people said was impossible. There's three things we need to do. Uh, number one, clearly we need a law enforcement presence on the Springwater Corridor. It is a public health and a public safety problem and we are hearing about it on the Portland side of the line too. There's too much criminal activity. But the way you do it is you've got to get people off the streets by providing them an equally attractive alternative. You get people who need help, people with severe mental health issues, people with drug or addiction issues, people, you have parents with kids, other people. Um, give them an alternative so that the police can deal with the criminality issue. And right now, the police don't have that option because we only have one shelter bed for every three people. It's probably better than that today, but uh, at the start of this campaign, one shelter bed for every three people who are counted as homeless in our community. Number one, we could ask the Jordan Menashes of the world. Number two, uh, we could innovate the way Vancouver, British Columbia does with modular housing. We've got modular housing manufacturers. They can provide flexible, movable shelters that could potentially last up to 50 years, and they can be moved around and used in different capacities at a much lower cost than bricks and mortar, the traditional bricks and mortar. And third, we can innovate. It galls me that the city of Portland is sitting on a 16,000 square foot facility right outside of the downtown area that's been vacant for four years that Nike in two weeks converted into a world-class track, temporary showers and bathrooms, heating and air conditioning by backing a truck up into the facility, a temporary retail outlet for a two week event. Are there no architects? Are there no innovators? Are there no creatives in this community 
that could think of a use for an unused 16,000 square foot facility on three flat acres close to the downtown area that could potentially be used to solve this crisis. Uh, I believe we can solve it. We're not going to end homelessness. It's been with us for a long time. It'll be with us for a long time. But we can mitigate the increases that have happened because of the economy. We're seeing more families, more people of color, more couples. There's more demand for people who want to get off the streets, and we should do what we can to accommodate them so that we can then address the public safety and the public health issues that are left behind. But right now, the police and public uh, you know, service providers, they really don't have any alternatives but for us showing leadership on this issue. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. Jim Grammer, Madden Industrial Craftsman. Uh, technically an unfair question because technically it's outside the purview of the position to which you both aspire, but uh, our greatest current business tragedy is the lack of container shipping. Uh, I think all the business community would appreciate some meaningful comments because the uh, silence, frankly, from certain quarters has been deafening. Well, thank you uh, very much, and of course, uh, when Terminal 6 shut down, that effectively created two problems. Number one, out of every, one out of every 10 jobs in this state, it's not just a Portland issue, one out of every 10 jobs in this state is dependent upon agriculture and the percentage of those dependent upon trade is even larger. And when we lost our two largest shippers from this area, what it also did was it added more trucks to the road, thousands more trucks, which adds to the congestion that, that somebody had asked about previously. Portland, of course, uh, is intervening in a dispute between the operator of the port and those who provide the labor at the port. And the state and the county and the port, excuse me, the state, the city, and the port, I'll throw in the county too, sure they have a stake in this, uh, clearly need to be working on the same page to help resolve this issue. And if they cannot resolve the labor issue first, you're not going to be able to find a port operator to come in and operate Terminal 6. As mayor, um, as a candidate for mayor, I'm not privy to those discussions. I know they are ongoing. I know the governor is involved. I know that the port is involved. Uh, I'm not privy to those conversations, but at the time when I'm elected and I'm allowed to be at that table, I will be a very aggressive voice seeking, seeking to resolve that issue. Uh, we are, after all, called port land. And I think it's important that we have a terminal export facility. That was a good joke. I thought that was actually pretty good. That wasn't bad. <laughs> That was on the fly. <laughs> of course, we're named for Maine, but uh, <laughs> I don't actually have a lot to add to that answer. I, I think it's a pretty good answer. I will just simply say that uh, one of the things that I've learned as chair of the Oregon Solutions process for Levy Ready Columbia, which includes the port, which includes multiple jurisdictions, is how important it is to have steady leadership to get everybody in a room to figure out really complex situations, especially when there's money on the line. And having a mayor who's willing to be that chair and engage, and this was something that I started out uh, as uh, co-chair of Levy Ready Columbia. Uh, mayor Hales was the, the other co-chair in that process. Uh, he decided that uh, he was not going to continue in that role, and so left me as chair, uh, as a county commissioner in a jurisdiction uh, that didn't really have a huge dog uh, in the fight, uh, but had a convening power. And so I didn't have a lot of direct levers on how to address those issues. But I had the ability to get people in a room and have a conversation about it. And because of that, we've been able to make enormous progress. We have a plan, we have a funding strategy, and we're on track uh, to get this done with over 25 different jurisdictions at the table. So I'm going to be a mayor who's going to dig in, who's going to have those good offices, and who's going to build coalitions to find a solution uh, on the port and on a lot of other things. Hi, Kathy Clevenger from Microchip Technology here in Gresham. Hi, Kathy. Uh, so my question is that some of your positions are clearly don't align with the business community. Um, and so what is your position for the city of Portland or what are your plans um, to attract good wage jobs to the Portland region? 
um, other than software jobs, because not everyone wants to be a programmer, and that's kind of what I hear all the time. So what are you doing for businesses, or what's your plan to do for businesses? Thanks for the question. And what we've seen in the Portland area, what we've seen in Multnomah County, what we've seen in the region is a trend that actually mirrors a national trend but is particularly acute here, where you have high wage jobs that are growing and you have service level jobs that are growing and not a lot of family supporting middle wage jobs. I was recently talking to uh, a gentleman who owns a uh, industrial company in northwest Portland and he was talking about the fact that his workers there, uh, most of whom have no more than a high school education, uh, earn forty-five uh, to $50,000 a year with full benefits and good industrial jobs. Those are family supporting jobs and we need to make sure that we have an economy that's focused on job creation in sectors that do produce the, those kinds of middle wage jobs. I'm a big fan of the tech sector. I think there's a lot that can happen there and I, lo I love the fact that we have puppet labs in downtown Portland with 400 high wage jobs. But we need more than that. That does not an economy make. So what I've said is we have a uh, economic development planning process in Portland where we've had a little bit of the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing. We've had Portland Development Commission that's been leading a lot of the economic development strategy both on business attraction and on business growth. And I'm not a PDC basher. I think PDC has done a good job with the tools that they have. But it's a little bit of square peg round hole. And I actually want to crib from something that uh, Mayor Bloomberg did in New York. Mayor Bloomberg created the Department of Small Business Services uh, in New York. And it was a very, very successful model. And he pulled in all the different business assistance and planning programs from different places within the city and merged them into one place. It doesn't cost a whole bunch of money. You're just bringing in other things uh, that have already existed throughout the city. City. And so I want, I've proposed a Bureau of Small Business and Economic Empowerment uh, that will combine the Business Improvement District program, the Access to Capital programs, the Workforce Training, the Women and Minority Owned Small Business program, together with a concierge service that says, hey, you got a problem, you got a permit you need dealt with, you need a fee dealt with, here's a one-stop shop for you to be able to get the access that you need and a strategic planning function that says, where do we grow best? How do we grow these middle wage jobs? And is actually working with private sector organizations to understand what those barriers are. Uh, because we need not just plans that are living on the shelf, we need actionable plans that work across bureaus and that are working regionally to be able to develop the infrastructure to support those kinds of middle wage jobs. Uh, it's a different way of doing things, but I think it'd be a better way of doing things. So um, at the height of the recession, when we had a 14% unemployment rate in the state of Oregon, there were thousands of middle class family sustaining jobs that went unfilled in the state of Oregon. Why? Because people didn't have the education or the job training. I'm already down to a minute. They didn't have the education or the job training they needed to be qualified for those jobs. Um, we already know that the two fastest growing sectors in the city of Portland actually aren't around technology. It's construction and health care. And we already know that by the year 2025, there'll be 25,000 new jobs created organically, according to those industries, with wages over $25 an hour. The question is, will the people who live here have the education and the job training to be able to qualify for those new jobs? or are they gonna to have to recruit people from out of state? There are already jobs like that exist around welding, around electric, uh, around plumbing, um, in the healthcare professions, in the technology fields, even in retail. I spoke to the CEO of Fred Meyer. He's got room in his distribution facility, good wage jobs that require nothing more than a high school diploma and a little bit of additional technical training. The mayors need to work together, and I'm saying this is a regional economic issue to create as many pathways through community colleges, through public schools, uh, through the private sector, through labor training programs, through whatever means necessary to make sure that we have a workforce that is connected with the reality that we are in an increasingly skills-based economy. As far as recruiting, there'll be plays, you know, like Under Armour fits because it's with a cluster that already exists. Uh, but I think we need to be a little more clever than the usual political talking point about recruiting good jobs. We're going to grow jobs by growing a workforce that's qualified for the job growth that's already happening. Okay, we have time for one more question if you can keep your answers to under 30 seconds. 
okay? This is a test. Okay, here we go. I just want you to know, I didn't agree to that. I just sat here and nodded. So last question. What advantages or assets does Gresham possess that you as a Portland mayor would want to tap into? It's the people, it's the resources, it's the acknowledgement uh, that there are a lot of people who want to live in our community still, and Gresham represents an option for a lot of working class families that don't want to be moved out of the region, and people are terrified of being priced out and moved out. So we've got to work with you, not um, just because we want to be good neighbors, we need to work with you because it's an economic and a livability imperative for the city of Portland that we have a collaborative relationship. Was that under 30? Yes. We have an incredible workforce in Gresham, and, but we also have an incredible opportunity for job creation. There's industrial land capability. There are sites to be able to grow and expand businesses that just don't exist in Portland. If you look at tier one industrial land, uh, there's nothing in Portland of a large size for scalability. For jobs to scale, there's an enormous opportunity uh, in Gresham. And oh, by the way, uh, it's in Multnomah County and property taxes uh, you know, help everybody uh, in, in the region. So there's an enormous opportunity for partnership on jobs in Gresham that will benefit uh, our constituents in Portland as well. That was fantastic. <laughs> you guys managed to do that right on cue. So closing comments, closing comments starting with Mr. Wheeler. Well, thank you for having me here. I, I appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun. Jules, thank you. I always enjoy your company. Jules and I spend more time together than we do with our own wives. So we've become quite close on the campaign trail. Um, you know, you've probably come to recognize there's good candidates running for the position of mayor of Portland. Uh, I want your support. I would argue that there's one differentiating factor, and that is experience. That is a record of accomplishment. That is a record of having already worked with you and others around the region to accomplish important things. When I got to Multnomah County, uh, we had a board of county commissioners that didn't communicate or collaborate as well as they might have a leadership team that was in disarray, frontline employees who were disillusioned, and on top of it all, labor strife and a massive budget deficit. That is a very similar situation that the next mayor of Portland is going to walk into. I not only helped stabilize that organization, we got a lot of good work done. The Selwood Bridge, the East County Courthouse, the Mental Health Crisis Assessment and Treatment Center, doing the transportation work we did together to make sure that those 900 FedEx jobs wouldn't go somewhere else, living up to our pledge around public services like sun schools and libraries. If you elect me, you don't have to wonder whether or not I'm capable of leading in this difficult environment alongside your mayor and others, because I already have. And I think that's part of the reason why the last three mayors of the city of Portland have endorsed me. And I hope you'll consider it as you tell your friends who live in Portland, or don't tell Shane this, but as you move to Portland, <laughs> that you will, yeah, I know, we have to get into it a little bit here, Shane. Uh, I hope you'll consider uh, what it means to have regional players who actually can deliver on promises based on the fact that he has done it before. Thank you for having me here today. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here today and again reiterate that I think it means a lot. Uh, that you've had the candidates for Portland Mayor here uh, in front of your organization. I want to thank Ted, I want to thank uh, Lori and Shane and uh, all the folks here who have made this happen. I would be honored to have your support for Mayor of Portland and I believe that I bring to this race uh, something that is unique. I'm the only person in this race that has a clear track record of taking tough votes. When you're in the legislature you have a green button and you have a red button. Sometimes you wish you had another button, but you don't. You have to let people know where you stand. And over my three terms as state representative, over my time at Multnomah County, you can see exactly where I stand. I've worked hard on regional collaboration. I've worked for economic development for our entire state and for our region. And I've built partnerships and alliances that are sometimes unusual and unexpected for somebody who grew up in inner southeast Portland. That's the kind of partnership I'm going to bring to work with all of you. You can look at my track record to know what I've done and to know that I will be a mayor who will reach out that hand of friendship and who will work directly with you on a shared prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.
Wasn't that great? I, I just, I wish there was more people here that could have heard them. Gentlemen, you can go ahead and, and sit down. I've got a lot to say. <laughs> Not really. A recovering politician has less to say, trust me. I want to again thank the sponsors, Riverview Bank, Larry, thank you very much, and Portland General Electric, Gresham Barlow School District, and the Metro East Community Media for what you've done today to make this um, a success and to be have it be possible. You have in front of you our evaluation forms, and truly they work. We have listened to every single one of them except for the ones that say that was a terrible one. We didn't listen to those so much. Um, please put your comments down there. We do respond to them well. A couple of things next month, and both of you might want to attend, <clears throat> gentlemen. Next month, um, an issue that's really big to the business community is going to be at this very event, IP28. And um, we want to make sure that all of you are aware of that backbreaking, oh, wait, wait a minute, that's my politics. Uh, that particular gross receipts tax heavy on the gross. Um, it will be a pro and con, not a debate, but an informational time um, so that you can then judge to, for yourself how it might impact your business. Even though the um, initial thought was that it's only going to affect certain kinds of businesses and it's going to save the education problem again. That's my political speak here. We also have an event for only women. Sorry, guys. Um, Hear Me Roar is coming. Deb Knapp is our first guest speaker. I have some flyers I'd like to hand out to you uh, regarding that. It's a time for fun, food, inspiration, and we called it Hear Me Roar for obvious reasons. We want to know what women have to roar about, and we've got a lot to roar about. So I want to thank you very much. Warner, you did a great job today. Thank all of you for coming, and uh, for Persimmon, for a delightful and delicious lunch. Thank you again.